Everybody, welcome back to the ESL Hearthstone Legendary Series. We're one match in. We just saw Luigi's take down Azuzu in a mm -hmm. very quick 3-0 fashion. Really strong play from Luigi's. Uh, I'm happy to see players just play well mm -hmm. uh, instead of get nervous and make some, you know, uh, errors here and there. Like we don't want we go back and watch some of the the stream on delay ourselves. That's right. TJ and I do ghost the stream from time to time, uh, and we look back and just see the game. It's like, yeah, you know, would you rather have a swipe or a big game hunter? towards the end of that Rogue versus Druid game. It's one of those things where, unfortunately, there's not many other targets other than Dr. Boom yeah. uh, in a Rogue deck, an Oil Rogue deck, and there's many times where he could have helped clear the board a little bit better or even push for potential lethal. Uh, and these small little decisions end up costing Azuzu, and Luigi just took the game. I yeah. think it just goes to show you that Luigi is definitely a really strong technical player. Oil Rogue is one of the more complicated decks. And it was a really well done series from his behalf. Yeah, you can look on the surface and say, oh, well, he didn't have wild growth mm -hmm. in the first couple of games. But there's small little decisions like that that really um, make the difference. So uh, next match is going to be Cornico versus Luffy. The winner of this will go on to face Luigi's in the semifinals. Uh, we talked a little bit about Luffy before, but Cornico, uh, he's a player. He recently got picked up by uh, Hearthletics. Um, so mm -hmm. um, uh, that was after his run to the Legendary Series. He's a Japanese player. He's, he's got... A really interesting lineup, too. Mage, yep. Druid, and Warlock. Yep. Uh, he's got two classes that are interesting tech. He's not bringing Warrior. Only a couple of players here are not bringing Warrior today, and he's one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. His uh, Mage deck, it, he actually, he's I, when I was talking to him, he's really animated. His English is pretty good. Corneco? Yeah, yeah. His English is... <laughs> His English is pretty good, uh, but he really tries hard. Even though he, he's, he's Japanese, he, he wants to be able to stream. He wants to learn English. When I told him what's his favorite thing, he's a student. When I told him what's his favorite thing to study, he said English. Oh, so, like, his cool. dream is becoming, like, a, a popular um, in the West. streamer in the West. Yeah, that's, good. that's, uh, that's his goal in Hearthstone. And he says um, that he, he wants to make a name for himself. It's not just about winning this. It's about... Um, winning this not for the money, not just for the experience of this tournament, but winning this to make a name for himself and sure. become big and start getting followers on the stream and stuff he like that. He so. is the only player to play Mage today, so that is a way to na make a name for himself. Yep. In the meantime, uh, he's going to have to go down against, or bring it down against Luffy, who apparently is on Team Never Lucky, so <laughs> AK doesn't have a team. Yeah. Luffy's got Warlock, Hunter, and Warrior. I get, I almost get the same vibe that Luffy and Impact are like, brothers or are they brothers i'm just being like no there's no way maybe but they, they they have kind of like a similar look and they practice together all the time so i wasn't sure if they're maybe like you know just really good friends and couples that spend a lot of time together mm -hmm. start looking like each other <laughs> <laughs> it happens sometimes never lucky though i mean it's a legitimate team he's been on never lucky for a while they, it's not like there wasn't like an official announcement or anything but just saying on that team as well oh is is he yeah gotcha uh, so, so he's definitely a part of, like, Just Hands are a really, really good player. Yeah, so they, they definitely have a lot of practice partners. They they hang out with a lot of really high legend players. Um, I, I mean, everybody always name drops Zixo, but Zixo literally is in every practice group, it feels like. Um, but it, I like that you say Zixo with a Z. Zixo. It's Sixo. Zixo. Like with an S. Sixo. I just put the X before the S. Hmm. Is it really Except six after C. It's six so like when I, number six. Like he always talks about people calling his name as he writes the le the number six and he writes the number zero. Hmm. Whenever I hear him pronounce it, it sounds like six so. Sure. All right, so uh, Mage versus the Hunter start things off. Is this Freeze Mage? You think? Freeze. Where would Freeze Mage fit in the current meta game? Since Warrior is popular. And Control Warrior to shut down the Patron Warrior would be popular. It feels like Freeze Mage wouldn't be that good. Yeah. Freeze Mage, there's still a lot of players that think Freeze Mage is really strong. But I just don't see where that comes from. With, like you said, Warrior's such a popular class right now. Even like Hunter. Like the mid-range Hunter is super popular right now. Uh, Druid. It's like when, when a player's lineup is like Warrior... Um, Druid and Hunter, which we've seen lots of Warrior Druid Hunters over the past couple of days. Like those are the three decks that usually fare the best against Freeze Mage. So I'm not sure why it's highly rated. I can imagine this is going to be some sort of tempo mage. Yeah, that's what we've been come to see over the past couple of weeks is players well, leaning towards different variations of tempo mage. The thing about Freeze Mage is that it's so good against aggro, and if aggro is good, Freeze Mage gets a lot better. 
Just because it's so consistent with its draws, it can shut down the aggro, it can combo really well. Yeah. Um, Freeze Mage is decent against control decks. Um, it's just the mid-range deck really gives it a problem because of the burst and the combination. Yeah, that's pretty true. Um, but then there's a situation where that deck could become a liability if someone doesn't bring a good aggro deck. Like, the Ignite right. got into a position like that. Uh, when he played in his regular season Legendary Series week, he brought Freeze Mage, and he struggled to find wins with it because all the players were playing very control-heavy styles. There was a lot of Warriors that week. There was a lot of Druids that week. And... Uh, and he fell in the round after thinking that Freeze Mage was going to carry him. It was the same with Oskaka. So it's it just sort of starting to get phased out a little bit. Yeah, I can see that for sure. Looks like we, uh, we have a little bit of a uh, pause just before we actually start the series. But um, I'm, I'm curious to see what's going to happen. One of these guys are going to the offline finals. Pretty cool if we have a guy from Japan do it. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan's been known to be you know, prolific into the card game scene back in other CCGs like Magic the Gathering, yep. Yu-Gi-Oh, um, even Pokemon. I don't really know too much about Japan and other games, but I do know that in card games specifically, they really enjoy it. Hearthstone, of course, is this weird fusion because I know in Japan, uh, PC gaming is not really as prevalent just because they, you know, they don't really associate PC gaming too much with like a very social thing. It's more yeah. of like a private in your yeah. bedroom type of thing. Uh, versus like RKs and FGC type of thing. That's why Japan players yeah. are like really good at Street Fighter and MVC, that kind of stuff. Yeah, console it's, fighting games. Yeah. And then, you know, now that Hearthstone is gonna be out on mobile and it's less PC, I wonder if Japanese players will start like, you know, start gravitating towards it pretty heavily and start enjoying it more because it's a really fun game. And uh, it's cool to see some international diversity. Yeah, we're actually starting to see a couple of Japanese players break out on the scene. We saw Cross over the past couple of days, and sure. um, Cross and Korniko, they're they're friends with each other, and they said they the Japanese Hearthstone community, even though it's small, is a tight knit group of guys. I would imagine so. It's kind of like Korea in a way. Uh, Korea is so tight, and Kranich is like so dominant yeah. because no one else really plays at his level in Korea. Mm -hmm. But you just pretty much know everybody yeah. in the local scene when. It's there's not that many people versus in Europe and America the scene is really big so it's hard to be friends with everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kranich actually competed in a couple of the Open Legendary Series matches. Uh, a couple of these players actually beat Kranich on their way here. Um, I believe um, Modern Leper was one of them that we saw nice. yesterday. So we were very close to seeing Kranich, but we did not. Well, maybe we'll, we can get an opportunity to see Cranich uh, in a future season. Fortunately, he probably can't compete in the North American qualifiers for the last call qualifier. So why don't you go ahead and talk about that, TJ, while we have a, a second here. Yeah, last chance qualifier. That's going to take place, I believe, next week. Uh, it's open to it's an open qualifier for the last eight spots at the Legendary Series Land Final. It's open to only North American players since it's so close to the Legendary Series Land Finals. Uh, everybody outside of North America would have too much trouble um, getting a visa, getting a flight here in time. Um, due to like the time restraints of, of visas and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, you can head over to legendaryseries.com to get more information. But you, if you are in North America and want your shot at competing in the Legendary Series Land Finals, head over there. It's, I, I mean, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, pretty much. It's, North America doesn't have many lands. Once-in-a-lifetime, TJ. It's, it's definitely a cool opportunity, but... For some players... For some players, it, it could be their it's the summertime. opportunity to break out. It's the summertime. There will be more Hearthstone for in the future, though, I think, to the point. Once in a lifetime, TJ? I think so. Once in a lifetime is like watching Kael Thazad come out of Steed's Old Shatter three yeah. times in one okay. series. There That's are, once in a lifetime. There are some players. The chances of that is, is literally one in a million. There are some players that would go to one land and then never play another competitive Hearthstone match in their life. Okay, fair enough. So we'll get it an all-expenses-paid trip. Yeah. yeah. You're exactly. selling this pretty hard to me. All right, maybe I'll sign up, TJ. Okay. I've, they told me I'm not allowed to sign up. You're not allowed to sign up. No. What about me? Can yeah. I sign up? I think you can sign up. I'm hosting the event. I'm not necessarily a commentator. Yeah, I know. They, they said, we don't want to find another commentator, so you're not allowed to sign up. Which, actually, I was flattered because they're saying, oh, you actually have a legitimate shot at making it. So you're not allowed to sign up. If they didn't have faith in me as a Hearthstone player, they would say, oh, yeah, Zuma, go sign up. Whatever. You're not going to even make it past the round of 128. No, oh, so that's why I'm allowed to, because they, they know I don't have a chance. <laughs> Flame Strike already implies that it definitely is potentially one of those tempo decks or late-game decks. It's not Mech Mage. 
Looks like Freeze Mage. It looks like Freeze Mage because of the Acolyte of Pain and the Thorson. All right. Well, bold moves by Koriniko. To bring I mean, Freeze Mage, if that's the case. Bold is one thing, but um, it might even be good, depending on how many people bring the Control Warrior. But I don't think so, because the winner of this plays yeah. Luffy, right? Well, this so, is Luffy. Oh, sorry. The winner of this plays Luigi's. Luigi's yeah, the yeah. other guy that begins with L. Um, yeah. And if he wins... He has to play against a, p a guy who has Control Warrior around today. Mm -hmm. so. Definitely not happy to see that on the first match. Corneco, of course, he is going to have a pretty good time against Hunter. I think uh, Freeze Mage has definitely been, gotten to a really good spot against Hunter overall, especially since Flare is not ran anymore. Yeah. People have started cycling Lotha about. Midrange Hunter has a little bit better of a chance. Right, Lotha is usually in these decks. Yeah. And it also has stickier creatures. You're not necessarily removing like all of their um, burn just with pings early on in the game. Like True. you have to stop the damage and deal with a pretty annoying board uh, at most points. And they can do large amounts of burst in a single turn. Whereas Face Hunters, uh, yeah, they have burst, but it's it's just like medium-sized pecs all the way until you die. Whereas mid-range hunter is like, well, they can put out some damage early, but later in the game they can make big turns. If Savannah Hymane can swing to face on the same turn that Lothab can swing to face because it came down the previous turn, couple that, couple that up with like a kill command, and uh, you can force a mage to play defensively early on in a situation where they would otherwise be able to just try and develop their hand a little bit more, draw into some cards. Yeah, I'm really liking the proto proto hype. Hunter nowadays. I was playing that on ladder today. Went something absurd like 11 and 1, 12 and 1. Can confirm. Yeah, TJ was watching it with me. It's really powerful because it gives you multiple options to play a more controlling type game or a more aggressive type game mm -hmm. while still not, while still, while still keeping like that hunter pressure level of like, oh, I just win games because I hit the face. Yeah. But you do have the ability to play more board centric. Huffer here is just solely that the opponent can't draw cards because the Acolyte won't be attacking. It'll just be a card source of ping. But I think I'm okay because I know that's not Ice Barrier, so I just want to get the Huffer damage in. Just quite a bit of damage. Spectator on point showing us Freezing Trap for the Hunter, Ice Block for the Mage. Even though we could have deduced. Deducted? Deduced? Deduced is the right, correct term. Um, the... Thanos seems like a play that you can make here so that you can get another card draw, activate it, have the Acolyte um, have the acolyte attack next turn. It's just a little unfortunate because it seems like Thanos Ice Lance is the play here, and it's a little inefficient. I wonder. Hmm. These early turns are actually pretty hard. Right. I guess he could also ping his Acolyte if he wants to, and then get wish for a Frostbolt, and if he doesn't, he Ice Lances. Yeah. But that's... Out of... I guess you have to proc the Freezing Trap anyway, but not getting any value of the Acolyte early on. Do you have to proc the Freezing Trap? I mean, you're a Freeze Mage. You could just never attack into it. Exactly. Eventually, you're going to get a draw to that Acolyte of Pain. This is so much damage done by Huffer. Eight damage with a kill command in hand. Oh, man. Wolf Rider comes in the hand. So he's got five, eight, twelve. And then he can keep weaving hero powers yeah. over two turns. This matchup is the one of the most important to weave hero power in every turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, although it starts getting more important as the mid-game starts coming on here. The, the minions here are generating the damage. Yeah. This is like a Frost Nova Doomsayer turn if your opponent has one. Frostbolt is it. Frostbolt would have come last turn if he had pinged his own Acolyte. He would have had a lot easier of a way to deal with the board if he had done that and been able to preserve the draw from his Acolyte the following turn as well. But it's you can true. Never count it's on true, that. but it's uh, it's you know it's very results based. Yeah, yeah. Can't can't always estimate it based off that. But Frostbolt is a good card here, assuming that nothing too dangerous comes out of that pilot shredder. If you're afraid of the pilot shredder when it drops, you can just ice lance it. Wow, he just used the whole. That's so much damage. 
I mean, the thing is, Frostbolt effectively gained you a couple of hit points, which you could use at this point. There's also a potential that it doesn't gain you any hit points, but it's likely to gain you at least one. Well, I mean, that's why you can Ice Lance it. I wonder. Oh, instead of just Frostbolt. Right. But he's going to be put below 10 health this turn. That's so much pressure. He's not even close to even being able yeah, to use is, like a defensive Alex Straza. This is just way too much. Yeah. He can't hit Alex Straza fast enough. If he Thorsons here. Actually, the Ice Bear is a really big draw. That's a really big draw. Now you just ping and play the Ice Barrier. But it's still within like kill command. Oh man, that's actually really bad. He's still within kill command and uh, hero power range. Yeah. So next turn, his opponent can coin. Uh, Creeper, kill command, hero power. If he plays his ice barrier, but the ice barrier is the better play. Thorson is like asking your, you can't, you really can't expect your opponent to, um, like trade into Thorson. He's just gonna go face and then pop the ice block. And this is, uh, I mean, if I was him. Think about that ice lance just, just sitting there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Luffy recognizes his opportunity. He's going to go kill command and coin hero power. And then now he just has to hope his opponent doesn't draw into the second ice block. Yeah. And even if he does, well, there's still going to be an extra turn before Alex Draza would be able to come out. So he's right. got a couple turns here, even if ice block is drawn, to be able to push through he needs just with hero power alone. It's the, the heal bot is his last chance. Ice barrier doesn't help at all. And he's dead. Yeah, I have to identify that I think if I had to choose, it might be the Ice Lance. Like, just not. Like, he's taking too much damage. If he could have bought health, that Ice Lance would have been better. Or that Acolyte was on the board drawing more cards. Yeah. Well, it was a pretty quick game one. Fluffy is going to take it. The thing about playing two card draw sources that you have a freezing trap is that one of them has to get hit anyways, and most likely it's going to be the acolyte. If the acolyte, and it has to be like three or more damage, because you don't care if the Thanos gets tossed back, but you don't you do if the uh, if the acolyte does because that's multiple card source draws. Yeah. So what most likely would have happened is your opponent kills off Thanos and you draw a card anyways. Mm -hmm. But by isolating them one by one, it becomes this thing where you only can deal with one minion at a time, and you also didn't gain the health, and the Freezing Trap was live. Otherwise, Freezing Trap doesn't really get value in this matchup. What does it usually do? Nothing. It stops Alex Strauss from hitting the face in a desperate situation. That's about it. Yeah. And there, so, are, there are some situations where Alex Strauss hitting the face opens up opportunities yeah. for lethal, but um, if, it gets, <laughs> if it gets to that point, then you had a really great game. Um, up until that point against Hunter. <laughs> it's just the way it falls, I guess. Yeah. And uh, you have to also chalk it up to Corneco not having some of the key cards that he really needed. Um, Frostbolt came a little bit too late. Didn't really have anything like Frost Nova to stop it. Ice Bears are drawn a little bit too unfortunately late, too. If the Mad Scientist was able to pull out the or Ice Bear instead of the Ice Block, would have bought him a little bit more time. Yeah. That kind of stuff. I also feel like he didn't respect the damage that much in terms where he could have prevented uh, feel like four damage from Huffer or four damage from Piloted Shredder. Could have bought himself a couple of turns. Like on that last part, the where he popped the ice block wouldn't have been possible. Could have maybe bought enough time to get the defensive Alex Straza. Could have been a different game, but we are going to move on to the second match here in a moment. Luffy still has Warlock and Warrior remaining. And this seems to be the standard lineup that we've seen over the course of the last three days. It's Hunter, Warlock, Warrior. Yeah. Seems to be the the lineup that most of these players are going with. And I would probably have to agree that those are the three strongest classes at the moment. Well, it feels like it's a pretty good opportunity for him to run over the mage deck if he has Control Warrior too. Um, I don't feel like Freeze Mage is that great against Handlock now. Um, still has to deal with the big threats. You have to get the right draw to the right time. The Doomsayer does have to get popped, but he can silence it. And then if they play Ragnaros, you just get blown out. But that's um, that's pretty wishful thinking some of the times. If it's Zoo, I think there's definitely a chance for Cornego to even out the series. But first, before we see that, we'll have uh, the Warlock versus the Warrior. Yeah, either way, I think that the Mage from Corneco might have a tough time. Whether it's Control Warrior or Grim Patron Warrior. 
Great Patron Warrior, I think, is still just as good. You don't have as many ways to gain armor, but... Oh, it looks like it is going to be Great Patron. Yeah, Patron Warrior is really powerful and effective. Loot Hoarders seem to be the inclusion of choice here. There's a few people who just different differentiate mm -hmm. themselves. Some people play the Inner Rages and the Loot Hoarders to be a little bit faster. Some people play Sludge Belchers uh, and Gromosh to be a little bit more late game oriented. Yeah. Which list do you personally like, TJ? Um, Commanding Shout is probably my favorite. Just because, uh, like using Commanding Shout, uh, lots of card draw early on with loot hoarders, but then curving out with larger bodies later on, like Piloted Shredder. So I run two loot hoarders, one Commanding Shout, um, one Piloted Shredder, one Dread Corsair. No Gnomish Inventors. And one Inner Rage. So that's my favorite. I think it's got a good balance. And I think Commanding Shout's the only way you can beat a lot of decks. Well, not a lot of decks. Handlock, specifically. There's a lot of Handlock on the ladder right now. Job's done. There is. That's partially why I think Hunter is so effective on ladder. And Hobgoblins and Warbots as well. Yep, in there. those are the most effective. In fact, um, I believe you're undefeated with Hobgoblin Warrior against me. Against you, yeah. Undefeated. Yeah. And I'm undefeated against ladder. Mm -hmm. Actually, I lost once. With my Hobgoblin Warrior? No. Oh, okay. I'm saying on ladder today. Oh, okay. I've been undefeated, but I actually did lose once. That shaman it feels got good. You. I was I was experimenting a ton with dragons. I was getting like a 55% win rate. I was like winning three games, 55%, losing two, and then like you know winning three and then losing three, like that kind of streaks. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Maybe it's just time to play a little bit of that hybrid hunter and learn the deck. Mm -hmm. And then uh, before I knew it, 20 minutes later, I won 10 games in a row. 20 minutes later, Something. the deck does play pretty fast. So the Control Warrior normally has uh, difficulty setting up against the Handlock in a way that's significant. That way, <laughs> like, the threats you have to deal with, like, small minions. But, yeah. No, there are things like Frothing Berserkers and ways to set it up, so that way you're pretty decent against the, the Handlock as the Patron Warrior. It's really tough because you basically have to set up a turn where you can get through a wall with Execute or just your weapons and other creatures and then push through for damage with a really big frothing berserker. Mm -hmm. um, without commanding shout, to be able to just preserve the health of all the creatures that you have on the board by getting through the wall, it's really tough to find opportunities where the stars align enough for you to push through later in the game with that kind of stuff. Um, I have seen blowout wins early on with Grim Page and Warrior um, facing off against Handlock where you just get so aggressive with your weapons early and then close it out with like frothing berserker in a rage with a death bite, sure. and you can allow it to take so much damage, but that rarely happens. This matchup is super tough. It hasn't gotten to that point yet, though, where he can say, this is Patron. Well, I guess the Loot Hoarder. Loot Hoarder actually yeah. revealed everything. Yeah. Sometimes it can be really hard, though. You don't know until... Uh, especially like turn seven. Yeah, yeah, especially since just saying his list with the uh, Sludge, Sludge Belcher. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it curbs out. They're like, oh, well, I'm just going to use Armor Smith. Cool Taskmaster, Acolyte of Pain, Death Bite into Sludge Belcher. You're like, oh, okay, it's Control Warrior. Right. And then Thorsten drops down. You're like, okay, still kind of yeah. borderline. And, and then, then you die. You know, I'll fight count me. <laughs> it's like, oh, jeez. So you can deal with this Sludge Belcher and create Grim Pages, but you set perfectly into Hellfire. Your own Sludge Belcher is... Not too bad. In fact, you kill off the the Ancient Watcher with the Whirlwind Effect. And by playing the Sludge Belcher now, you set up so that Thorazine can be stronger next turn. Yeah. In a lot of matchups, you want to preserve Grim Patrons. And you don't want to, since that's a lot of what plays into your win conditions, is making big boards with Grim Patrons. But I think you can be... Um, very liberal with your Grim Patron usage in the Handlock matchup because you want them to have awkward turns early on with Hellfire. Like, you want them to Hellfire early on one Grim Patron as opposed to Hellfiring later when you're, like, pushing for damage. And also, right. if you don't do much here, it allows them to build a big threat. Like, if you put out a Mountain Giant here or a Twilight Drake and you didn't have a way to deal with it, it would be useless. And the Grim Patrons are not your main win condition against Handlock. It's Frothing Berserker. It's Frothing I Berserker. Wonder. So then if he Hellfires here, he can't develop a minion. 
versus the Sludge Belcher, he could develop a minion because he can't get past it anyways. Yeah. In fact, because he did, he didn't develop Sludge Belcher. He can't play like the Emperor. Yeah. Now he has to Hellfire. Does he tap? So many possible. I think you're you're free to tap. You don't really yeah. have that many threats other than Thorson. And Drax is, is just really far away. You're not really going to play it. Yeah. As a threat. No, you're worried about huge. I, I don't. You could even just play Thorson here. You think so? Yeah, well, I mean, you're you not feel like about if he drops uh, War Song Commander and Frothing Berserker on six mana, which is possible. He gets. He would only have like ten damage. Feels like you're asking for trouble by doing that. Yeah. I suppose. What about just uh, War Song Commander and just Whirlwinds? Not, forget the Father Berserker, just mm -hmm. like Whirlwinds and just kill him. Yeah. But all these decisions are starting to snowball upon each other. Luffy now gets an easy way to play. That. He's going to deal with by playing his own Thorson. Yeah. This could be one of those games. I, if I was Luffy, I would start thinking about pushing for um, for damage sooner rather than later. Well, you set up Death Bite and you have Gromash next turn. Yeah. You sort of have to put your opponent on having the, the right answers in this matchup. You have to play the aggressor. You have to be the one that sort of dictates the pace of the game instead of trying to like set up huge combos. You, you preserve cards like Frothing Berserker unless you know you're going to get really great damage out of it. And you preserve cards like Warsong Commander. But you know that it's eventually going to get to the point where your opponent is going to be able to build up a wall. It's just so hard to play around that type of thing with this deck. That sometimes it can be really enticing just to try and push for damage while you can. And maybe just get a blowout victory on turn 8. Before they have a chance to draw into a lot of their big threats. Sure. I think Death Spite and Sludge Belcher here is okay. Um, you just want to be able to hit it twice. So he's going to go with the Frothing Berserker instead. Oh wait, no, if he reduces the mana again, next turn he can Gromosh. Oh, he doesn't, okay, chance of trading, huh. So I thought if he ended up hitting the face there and reducing it, he has Gromosh with a death spite, and then you equip another weapon and whirlwind effect there. Uh, this and is hit the face. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, this sort of doesn't serve the same purpose, but it can sort of have the same effect. So right, but this where you get extra damage with the frothing berserker doing the thing you just mentioned by equipping death spite and then um, re-equipping another weapon. Okay. Right. I mean, I'm just trying to calculate everything here. The frothing berserker. Would have been nice, too, if he could get the weapon up for the death bite, but he can't. And also, by not attacking, he also plays around Molten Giants, so his opponent can't drop it and then go for a big defensive play. Yeah. So, um, from hand, next turn, Luffy can do uh, 7 damage on board, plus uh, 4 from the death bite, so that's 11. He could play the armor smith and re-equip another weapon for three extra damage on the frothing berserker for 14 total damage. Well, he's also got just Gromosh, Fire War Act for another seven, so that's 14. That's another seven, so 14. As well. Yeah, that's assuming that y your opponent doesn't play anything. Healbot ruins all that. Yeah, but what Healbot allows you to do is build up the frothing more, <laughs> so that way you can like play more for the board. Yep. And now you can set up like a legitimate death spite. Death spite, loot hoarder. Yeah, well, death spite, hit the Lotheb, equip the fiery war axe, and then sludge belcher into the three, the four, three, three, four into the three, three. I guess I don't know if you want to hit the face though with the falling berserker. Maybe it's not time for it though, because how much damage would that be? It'd be plus two. I don't know if Plus I'd use one. the whirlwind effect yet from the okay. death bite. Uh, because the, the get rid of your activator for Grom. I mean, in reality, you could use That's true. your frothing berserker next turn to push through like a taunt and then use Grom as your lethal or the other way around. It's also a good point. 
So, so he might just attack into the uh, anti heal bot with the death death bite here, right? And then play creatures and go face with his sludge Belcher, frog and berserker. Put him at like what seventeen, which gets rid of an opportunity for like big swing plays with molten giants. And then he sets up next turn where he has. Whoa! I was not expecting that. He's not. He's want to get Shadow Flame. Oh yeah, that's true. But by doing so, his opponent now has a little bit of breathing room because the Frothing Berserker has ended up dropping. If hmm. Corniko taps, it puts him in lethal range. Because he has 10 damage showing on board plus Grom, so that'd be 20. I, oh, I see. So if he taps, then that does still give him lethal, even after giving up his Frothing Berserker to play around Shadow Flame. Yeah, kind of. You know, he can just tap, play Giant Farseer. Yeah. That that wouldn't be too awful. In fact, that might be the strongest play he has available. He also can Rag Heal. But Rag doesn't seem very powerful too. It hits a loot hoarder. He has execute. Yeah. I think Earth Ring Foster is a must. Because even if he has Grom like cool taskmaster, like a reduced cost Grom, cool taskmaster, that'd be twenty two damage. So he needs to be above twenty two damage at the end of this turn in order to stay safe. Stay safe. Tap. I don't mind Sylvanas either, to be honest. It's, uh, you use the same amount of mana, and Sylvanas gets a little clunkier. Although you still can ship Sylvanas Shadow Flame. But most likely, you're not going to be stealing a minion through Sylvanas Shadow Flame. You'd be clearing the board. So yeah. Shadow Flame is more of like a board clear mechanism, while Sylvanas can, like, put pressure off and allow you to start attacking, uh, with things like the Ragnaros. Mm hmm. Another really key emphasis point is like picking up that Sun Fury Protector because before that he had no defensive cards to like shut down any kind of Grim Patron trades or mm -hmm. Frothing Berserker win. Well, Luffy's got a couple opportunities here to draw with the Loot Hoarder and the Acolyte of Pain. I would imagine he wants to just try and throw in this Loot Hoarder first to see if that changes anything. Yeah. Speak to me. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. See what he's got here. Another whirlwind uh, effect. Sorry, yeah, that's his first whirlwind. Yeah, yeah. He has his another whirlwind effect. He's still just a couple of points off from being able to find a way to kill his opponent, but he doesn't really have that good source of card draw here. He needs to pick up battle rage. Oh, whoa, battle rage would be or mint. execute <laughs> second world. At one point, you also have to decide when you're going to be able to be aggressive. That feels like such a weak turn. Well, kind of. He still has Gromash for 10. Oh! Wow! Harrison Jones! That's pretty awesome. Yeah, especially since he equipped a fresh Fire War Axe. The yeah. thing is, does he want to use it on a Fire War Axe or save it for a Death Bite to not give him the opportunity to... And also, uh, how does he... If he uses five mana on Harrison so Jones here, what mana does he have left over to try and stabilize the rest of the board? He's got Shadow Flame for 3. Yeah, that's true. You can Shadow Flame the Harrison after he draws with it. Yeah, I'm thinking that you can... That um, in a museum. Maybe Shadow... I'm trying to find a different target to Shadow Flame. Maybe the Owl? If you, mm. No, no you can't do that. Maybe the BGH. You... Owl, if you Shadow Flame the BGH, then you're wasting, not wasting, but you're not getting the 8 damage in from the Mountain Giant this turn. Uh, you have I don't know if you're slime. concerned about racing your opponent, though. You just have to, like, outlast them. Then why wouldn't you BGH the Harrison? Uh, you can't actually play BGH because of the Giant, I, you know. I just realized. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, true, that's true. You have to target your own Giant first. That owl is legitimately flying. Oh, yeah. Okay, he landed. <laughs> he 
He needs the Harrison to get <laughs> pushed off first. Yeah. So, looks like uh, Luffy is two points off from lethal. That needs to be cool Taskmaster. And that, uh, even then, he would have been short a little bit. Now that would have been exact. Does he not have enough mana? Oh, he does have enough mana. Yeah. Would have right. been exacties. And now he's in a situation where mm. he's healthy. He can go for risks. Takes he's going. Damage. I mean, this is the risk. He's going to try and go for as much damage as possible. 13 to the face. Wow. Uh, but... I mean, now it's like big game Hunter Jaraxxus. He'll back up to 15. Cool story, bro. The, the Grom <laughs> is such a a weird card in the fact that, like, the actual Grom card is literally just Grom's face. Like, every other card shows, like, a little bit more, you know? Like, Mountain Giant has, like, a, oh, it's it's torso, it's upper body. Yeah, Grom, Grom is just Grom his face. A, he took a selfie. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what it is. It's probably just a good angle for him because maybe he's put on a little bit of weight and he doesn't want to show it. Maybe Grom got a little muffin top. That's why he gets angry so easily. Yeah. Well, too bad Harrison was used on a, a lowly fiery war axe. But he would have loved to have it in, uh, in another scenario here. Luffy is in trouble, but this was a tough matchup from the beginning. Yeah, it's so hard to piece together. And you have to like plan so many turns ahead right. and it's so hard to do unless you have ridiculous amounts of card draw in your first couple turns Yeah, because you can't guarantee that you're going to draw into any pieces. Sometimes you have to just go all out and hope that they don't have what they need to be able to deal with the board that you're putting out but in this case uh, Cordonigo did have um, all the answers and Luffy never really made a giant push maybe at the end there with the Grom mm -hmm. but there were so many things that could punish that and or survive against something like that and he knows that that was sort of the last frontier of pressure from Luffy because he was out of cards and he concedes Luffy gets stopped here in game number two so it's a tied series now I'm looking at Koroniko's lineup and maybe I was thinking about if he was targeting uh, Patron Warrior as potentially the deck that he wants to snipe so he's got Freeze Mage, he's got Handlock. But then I thought about Druid, and Druid, um, unless it's like super heavy ramp dragon taunt Druid, which isn't out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. Higher than zero. I don't really think Druid is that great against Patron War, personally speaking. He could be also playing like stupid stuff, Mill Druid that heals a bunch of stuff, Poison Seed, Starfall type of things in order to stop his opponent from playing the board. Seems weird, but I've been seeing a lot of Spectral Knights lately. Spectre Knights, uh, that was interesting, right? Yeah. Can't really deal with it on the Grim Patron's end. Can't execute it. Yeah. Weapons are really inefficient against it. Yeah. Uh, mm. Spectre Knight was a card that was put in a long time ago to counter warriors, but in another sense, in the Control Warrior. When yeah, it was a Control or, Warrior meta. You know, Miracle Rogue had a hard time do put doing yep. with it as well. Yep. It was like guaranteed pressure the following turn because it's just so hard to remove. Um, yeah, I think... Like four of the last six druids that I've played against on the ladder. Um, as Spectre Knight. As Spectre Knight. Wow. Or maybe it was nine out of the last ten. It's really interesting that people are just seeing it be included by one player, and then people just start like, oh, it's a good idea, let me try that. Oh, it's a good idea, let me try that. Everyone always makes fun of Grim Patron meme for, like, everyone get in here, but the reality is the top of Legend is just one giant Grim Patron warrior train of net decking. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, I copy here! I remember one of the players that played the Spectral Knight, it was Jason Zhu. Zhu? 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 Jason Z-H-O-U. He's finished uh, number Zoe. nine legend. Zhu? So it's the same as your, your last name. Um, uh, he finished number nine legend last season, and uh, he was he was putting Spectral Knights in his Druid, and I lost against him. Had no idea how to do, deal with that. As the... I was playing Light Bomb Priest. Light Bomb Priest. Yeah. Just, uh... Cabal Shadow Priest, that thing, with Trickmeister. Yeah, about that. Play Sylvanas. When it comes out on turn five. I mean, those are, like, ideal situations. I mean, the, yeah, there's ways to deal with it, but it's hard, especially for, like, a neutral f f uh, five drop. It's my control. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Yeah. 
Well, just no, do anything first against played, him, man. First you played Master Spell, and then, and then Mind Control. Just get better. <sighs> Play Resurrect, and then Resurrect your Sylvanas. That I've already played in the game at turn five. Well, what happened was you played Alarmobot, and it pulled out Sylvanas. Yeah. And then Sylvanas got silenced and killed, and then you Resurrect. I, I do play Alarmobot in my deck. It's like a reverse Death Lord, <laughs> but from your hand. And it's your minion. Yeah. Okay. We're going to try again. This druid seems to be more of the faster variant, but we'll see how things pan out. Maybe Cornico feels that druid is a very reliable deck. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been terribly effective in our first series of the day. It actually hasn't been that effective over the course of the weekend. Or the, over the course of the week, at least for our tournament, the Redemption Series. Um, I feel like Druid is one of the classes with the lowest win rates. Druid and Rogue. It, I mean, it's tough when you're in a world full of, full of very strong decks. I feel like the, especially on Thursday, we saw almost every player bring the exact same lineup. It's tough. It's a tough world. Do you play the Frothing Berserker here? What's it weak to? Swipe? Yeah, it's just swipe. Swipe's not even inefficient because it goes one for one. Could also be weak to Pile the Treader. He does have Despite as a. Bite, though. Yeah. If I didn't have Despite or a weapon in general, I don't think I would have played it. Mm -hmm. But you have ways to protect it. It's not. It's sort of the opposite of the Handlock matchup where mm -hmm. the Frothing Berserker, you want to make sure you hold on to it. Where in this matchup, it's like the Grim Patron is a lot of times your main win condition. Because Druids can deal with Frothing Berserkers a lot easier than they can deal with multiple Grim Patrons. Sure. I'm always scared of leaving a Frothing Berserker, though, because it seems like there's a lot of opportunities for your opponent to abuse it. If you play Death Spite, you draw a card. I guess you draw a card first. Or not. Mm. It does. I don't know if it would ever affect his play unless he draws fiery war axe. Yeah, if he draws fiery war axe, then he could play fire works down and battle rage yeah. as well. Battle rage. Yeah. yeah, that could be. Yeah, well, he gets another death bite, so doesn't really change things. Mm -hmm. Now his opponent can just wrath, but he gave up his coin for this, so now as a result, it's a little bit awkward. Yeah, and that, that's one of the main things, is to make the Druid's turns awkward. Because right Ooh. now, what are they going to play in tandem with Rath? Big game Hunter. <laughs> it's Actually, Why not? Yeah. Why not play Big Game Hunter? I may be saving it for Dr. Boom, but he's going to play it anyway. <laughs> I like that. It's cute. Yeah. It's like cycling it so that way you can move your hand a little bit. Yeah. Although your rats are one of your primary ways to deal with the patrons, you'd rather have two rats than uh, another card. But yeah, the truth is it does help him dig to a better answer. He doesn't know if he was going to draw Thor's in next turn. Yeah, like double rat keeper is usually the most effective way to deal with a board full of patrons. You usually end up trading like three for three in that scenario because a lot of times they're using like second charge of Despite in a rage and Grim Patron or a whirlwind, or whirlwind in a rage Grim Patron. So. You can be sort of weird and inefficient with your removal because a lot of times the warrior is weird and inefficient with their cards in order to gain more grim patrons. Speaking of which, patron is in the hand. So will Thorson be dropped down. Unless he wants to silence us to deny more card draw. The, the Thorson is good, but these cards are not the best. I mean, of course, it's like two innervates and a coin that you're getting regardless. And he is reducing one piece of the combo. I've seen better Thorsons. Mm. How about Thorsoning back? Is that two? Nah, I guess you can just Death Spite draw a card. Thor's the next turn. Death Spite actually is a better setup here. Because now you can ha be always be threatening for the Whirlwind effect. What now? Mm. Well, I don't know. Because if you don't Thor's in here... You throw us in next turn, that's a long time before you're able to start pushing out stuff. You throw us in this turn, you, you actually have Warsong Grim Patron the next turn. Plus yeah, something no, else. Mm, yeah, but there's nothing really to... There's nothing really to set up. 
Dr. Boom comes out on turn seven. Yeah, I think I think Despite's still a little bit better here. <laughs> like keeping your opponent letting your opponent keep third and twice as a druid is like one of the ways for them to come back. Because the problem with Druid in a lot of cases is that they can't do everything. They yep. can't remove the board, hands it up, and posture yourself for lethal. It's really difficult unless they get like innervates. Yeah. Oh, that's a nice card. Off the tippity top. And Sensation of the Lord came off the top, it's gonna stay there. How poetic. We don't even get to see the cards being drawn because he played it so fast. And now we get to see the choices. Does he play the Grim Patron? Does he play the uh, the Thorson? Thorson seems to be the best course of action. Yeah. You get to reduce so many expensive cards here. You only get one Grim Patron. Mm, I guess you can battle rage. Actually, let's see. What's crazy is that there's um, there's no whirlwind effect, so. You don't really get too much benefit off of um, the Grim Patron immediate synergy, but yeah, just imagine two. what it can do with other stuff. Yeah. There's also a chance that he's going to start worrying about combo, because he's at 15 health. It's true, and his opponent did th Thorson, so he has a realistic chance of having Force Nature, Savage Roar, and Hero Power. Yeah. He can't do that next turn. Oh, well, that's a Ragnaros. It's invisible. There it is. And it shoots the Thorson, so that means he has a little bit of health to work with. Wow. So he might have to slam for an option. And he mm. needs to pick up Execute. If he doesn't pick up Execute, he does he can flood the board. But it's very dangerous. Wow. Yes. Um looks like Sludge Belcher and I guess the Acolyte of Pain. Set up the fiery war axe. Mm-hmm. And then start hitting the face. That might be his best course of action. The alternative is to try to play the less useful cards like Harrison Jones. I wonder. But like we were talking about, it, be worried about combination attacks. Battle, Battle rage, rage for one card? To try to get the execute. Yeah, but that's... If you Battle Rage, you make your turn quite a bit weaker. Because then you'd just be playing Sludge Belch. You'd just be playing one target. Yeah. Off of the Zerka doesn't change anything. It's gonna play two anyway. But it's gonna get down to swipe. Wait, hold on. Silence, swipe. Savage Roar, swipe. I think that might be game. With Wrath? No, he can... 13. Silence is his. Oh, wait. Silence is his Wrath. That's definitely lethal. Savage Roar, swipe, yeah. S uh, swipe twice here. Okay, it doesn't really matter. Way. Yeah. And that's going to do it. Cornico finds a victory in game number three with the Druid over Patron Warrior. Uh, and he's got Freeze Mage remaining. And that's going to be really challenging oh, for Luffy to overcome, right? Freeze Mage is usually good against Patron Warrior. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of... It, oh! He draws the Execute off of the dead loot order. That is brutal. Heart Luffy breaking. dropped game three. And our Japanese player from Heartlytics... One game away from advancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that patron, the Patron Warrior Freeze Mage matchup kind of reminds me of like Oil Rogue versus Freeze Mage. Yeah. The Patron Warrior is sort of doing their own thing until they piece together a big burst combo. Mm -hmm. um, they can start, they can put pressure out a little bit earlier, similar to what Oil Rogue does. And then they're trying to pu get put on pressure and pop the block as quick as they possibly mm -hmm. can. Um, whereas the one thing that makes a difference is Patron Warrior a lot of times just armors up in the early game instead of putting one damage and re-daggering. So gotcha. it's a little bit better, but still is a rough matchup. It is because well, the the, uh, the flip side is there are ways for Page Warrior to fight against Freeze Mage. Um, sometimes it reminds me of Control Warrior. Where it just, Whoa! You armor, I never thought I'd heard you say you that. You armor up a bunch, Aww. and then you just have Armor Smith gain value. Yeah. But um, the thing about it, the difference between the Control Warrior is the pressure that it can put on. Yeah. Uh, not to mention that Thorsten, you know, like, what if he doesn't have a way to deal with Thorsten, just reduces the card to counts, you start pressuring a lot, and you don't have the Flame Strike, you don't have the Doomsayer, you just have, you know, burn, 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 burn. It's possible for him to draw really awkwardly. It's going to be hard, though. And after all of that, Luffy still has his Warlock class, which should be hard to win if he's playing Zoo. Which I think is more likely... I've seen Luffy play Zoo more than I've seen Luffy play Handlock. 
But then again, I mean, I talk about that a lot. That could mean that it opens up a really good opportunity for him to play handlock and surprise his opponent. Uh, but it's an uphill battle from here. He's got a couple tough matchups ahead of him. If it is handlock, it's a quite a bit different of a matchup than Zoo. Uh, it, it can deal with freeze mage usually a lot better. With huge boards, lots of pressure, ways to do a Doomsayer, ways to heal back up, stall out the game with things like Lotheb, even Jaraxxus. But we'll have to get to that after this game if Corniko doesn't even manage to take this one. But we are going to jump into game number four. Freeze Mage versus Patron Warrior. Patron Warrior. That's right. The highest quality of tequila. We have... Two draw mechanisms, Mad Scientist and Acolyte Pain. You can imagine that Ice Block gets tossed back. And Blizzard is very meh, so just go ahead and toss it and get it back anyways. That's what Mulligans means. Emperor Thorson, pretty important card to grab if you want to start putting pressure on, but still a little bit too early to draw him. He'd rather just get his loot hoarders. Yeah. Yeah, he needs to try and make as, as big of a hand as possible for that Emperor Thor's hand. Because he wants to open up options, and he wants to draw into burst combos. Horde means nothing. It's all about trying to piece together ways for you to deal, like, instant damage. Right. Or gain absurd amounts of armor. Like, those are the two primary win conditions. Yeah, it's, it's really tempting to try and go greedy with your own Acolyte on curve, but you have to deny the draw. That's one of the ways your opponent can beat you in this in this game slash series. Just keep drawing with Patron Warrior. Yeah. I haven't seen Patron Warrior struggle this much in a long time. Well, the... since my days of practicing with Patron Warrior, <laughs> I haven't seen it struggle this much. Yeah. I always like to bring up the fact that you were the pioneer of Patron Warrior. Oh, thank you. The pioneer. Not the, uh, one of them. No, no, the pioneer. The pioneer? All right. The, I was. I was a trailblazer in many ways. The first ever competitive player to play Patron Warrior in a large scale tournament mm -hmm. was Fro Dan. Dan. Fro. Christopher Columbus Dan. <laughs> Fro Dan the Man Dan. I haven't heard that one before. Oh, you just heard it now, so that's a lie. Battle Rage for one card. He gets an Armor Smith, pretty important. But now we have Coin Thorson! Or is he? Oh, wait. Yeah, he has five mana. Sorry. The Thorson was also hiding behind Flame Strike because he's shy. Yeah. Uh, and actually, no, he can just ping the Acolyte. Or because he wants to make an entrance. He can ping the Acolyte because uh, his opponent has a Death Spite out. He doesn't necessarily just want to waste it. Yeah. It's better. Mm. Getting the card draw is just more valuable because That's Thorson good. works better. Oh, it's potential for him to overdraw. Oh yeah, you're right. Ah, it's good heads up play. Potential to overdraw. Of course, guys like Rain, I don't care about it. Just usually pings it anyways. Yeah. Overdraws and burns Alex Straza. <laughs> Seems to happen like every time to him. Uh, okay, so that makes a big difference. Like one of the, I mean, well, sometimes, sometimes it's a small difference. Uh, Freeze Mage is the deck that gets punished the most from burning key cards because there's some cards that are just absolutely um, crucial for them to pick up victories, like Alex Straza, like Archmagia Tinnitus, um, or like a burn spell. Yeah, a decks lot of the, that don't matter, like Hunter. Yeah, anything that you can put Fell Reaver in. Yeah, mech decks. Yeah, it's but a lot of good Freeze Mage players will always, before they draw, count their cards and see is there any possibility that my opponent can mill me. And uh, we'll always play accordingly around that. But he's not going to go for the... Uh, I mean, he could overdraw him still, right? But it would... If he entered, like, Whirlwind and Ender Rage and stuff like that. But it's yeah. Not worth it. That's a lot of cheap cards, man. He can play his entire hand next turn for <laughs> three, four mana? Yeah. What? All right. Wait. No. <laughs> I was going to say, does he have lethal next turn? No if way. he drew into a Warsong Commander? Fair enough. He could Warsong Commander and play his whole hand, which is Whirlwind, Inner Rage, have an Armorsmith on the board, execute whatever's on the opponent's side. Sure. Wouldn't be lethal, but it would be a lot of pressure. But too bold of a play. He plays his Thorson. I was wondering if he could play Fireball and then Doomsayer, so then put Thorson would go into this next turn. This is bold. He's not even reducing the cost of cards that are like super, super high impact other than Flame Strike. Yeah. 
Oh. There's some burn spells in there. A nine mana Pyro Blast can sometimes be pretty good because you can fit in Pyro Blast and like a Frost Bolt. Right. This does give him a next play for Doomsayer on Blizzard for the following turn. And maybe he can bait out Execute. But his opponent has two Executes. Two Armorsmiths come in the hand. This is starting to look better for Luffy by the card. Yeah. Or by the turn, excuse me. Yeah, this is actually a really great hand. He's got Froth and Berserker for those big burst turns. He's got both key the key cards for his uh, two win conditions in the matchup. He's going to be able to make an absurd amount of armor if he so chooses in the next couple turns. Oh, man. I just realized that Frothing Berserker's eyes aren't the red dots. No, it's like paint. Yeah, it's like his eyes are below that. I just realized that. Oh my goodness. Weird. Yeah. Just like that moment where I realized Shea of Nax Ramus' head is not on the bottom of half the cards in the top left of the card. That is a lot of armor, by the way. And as a po he might even gain more with the flame strike comes down. Here's another thing, though. The deck does tend to draw a lot, too, so it just could run out of threats at one point. Mm -hmm. Paddle Rage for zero. I mean, that's almost all of his hand, though. Frost Nova Doomsayer is also pretty good for the future turns, but I think you Flame Strike this, right? Yeah. You have Thanos in Blizzard 2. That even might be better. So you can keep Flame Strike and you can set up for a card draw. So if you Doomsayer and Frost Nova here, what you're actually denying a lot of health. How is he going to deal with that? And even if he does deal with it, what's the problem? He, well, if you Frost Nova Doomsayer, he attacks the weapon and then executes. Yeah, but why is that bad? Because he gains a bunch of armor. Oh, yeah, from the Whirlwind effect. Right. And then, uh, he, I mean, he might even just Battle Rage now, draw five cards, drop more minions, and then yeah. execute. <gasps> oh, man. Second Falling Berserker. So he just needs to get his uh, Warsong Commander. Gets yeah. like a bunch of damage. This is so many cards. Yeah, Zero is... mana, draw five. <laughs> yeah. Strictly better than Auctioneer. With the Doomsayer, he was sort of putting him on not having second mm -hmm. execute. Oh, he's going to inner rage and just like smack the Doomsayer. Pile on. Oh, he's just going to use the zero mana execute. Fair enough. Yeah. And start putting on some deeps. Puts him at 11 health. Yeah, I think the Doomsayer was just really greedy. Yeah. It's putting him on not having second execute, but that's... Oh, my goodness. Especially because you didn't freeze his face, so he was able to get another round of uh, of armor. Corniko's saying, well, last game, it took you 15 cards, and you never even drew an execute. And this Doris is still reducing cards. All right. That first inner rage costs, like, negative three mana right now. Yeah. Now, I guess you just Blizzard. Mm -hmm. Blizzard and what's tucked underneath that Flame Strike? Pyro Blast for nine? Yeah. You Blizzard, you, you give him ten armor. Yeah. Blizzard, what Mad to Scientist. Do. What to do? Pass. It's the best you can do. And then hope your opponent doesn't have the Warzone Commander. Ten armor, Dan. Ten armor brings him to 47 health. 57 health. No, no, health. 57 health. He's going to have more armor than health. How do you even... Hmm. 57 points of damage is hard for a Freeze Mage to do even if nothing is happening on right. the board. Like, even if you gave the Freeze Mage the entire game to do 57 points of damage, it would still be difficult. Like, just to nothing. Just to, like, a target dummy. Yeah. Like, say, so here's a target dummy. I'm going to leave for 20 minutes. You have 20 minutes to do 57 damage to this target dummy. It would still be hard. Freeze Mage just might not have that much damage enough. He's got to play the Mad Scientist here, I imagine. He needs to get in some way to do damage. Oh, the Mad Scientist, though, is vulnerable to a uh, Grim Patron combo. Yeah, oh, I guess there is room on the board now. Actually, there's, a, there's quite some space on the board. If he draws Warzone Commander, I think it's lethal, by the way, right? Mm, well, Probably there's an ice block, so. Oh, you're right. There's an ice block. So it'd be like... You could pop the block. Popping, but that's... I don't know if you want to pop with uh, 11 damage, right? Yeah, because once you pop the button, don't stop. <laughs> well played, sir. 
Dr. Boom coming down here. Dr. Boom makes a lot of sense. You can even set up the uh, the loot hoarder so you can draw an extra card mm -hmm. and hopefully tap into that um, that War Song bank in your card deck. And then he can even armor up, bring himself. It's to really like armor up is so sixty key. health. This does, it reminds me so much of Control Warrior. <laughs> Stop it. Dude. I'm just, I'm blushing right now because I'm just so turned on by the Control Warrior play. You are a weird dude sometimes, man. <laughs> I know. You said something the other day, you said, I, I want to get into your brain for like one day just to see what your thoughts are like. No, I said imagine spending one day <laughs> in your head. Oh, I thought you said you'd want to. Yeah. I was like, you're crazy if you want to. <laughs> well, I guess that mad scientist did a little bit of something. Yeah. All right, so this Ice Block and Ice Barrier has 19 health effective. That's a pretty good card. Antonitis Coin Frost Nova, also pretty effective too, but he's got some work. Even if he manages to stabilize the board, he's throwing Burn into Threats instead of into Face. Right. Armor Up's going to happen every turn. Um, Interesting. Very interesting. Frost Nova Doomsayer. Doomsayer's not even 100% secured. Mm -mm. Well, he's been through both executes. He'd have to use some type of War 1 effect or like uh, War Song Commander and, and right. throw something into I it to be able wonder. to kill it. This is about the safest time you're ever going to be able to play I the Doomsayer. I think I'd Frost Nova Doomsayer and then ping the, the, the Gromosh. Just to set it up for a Flame Strike in case yeah. things go horribly, horribly wrong. No, not. If, when. Yeah. I, I'm not sure about paying the face here. Paying the face is directly ignorant of, like, Dooms here not, like, 100% guaranteed working. When we know, like, there's a really strong chance with Dr. Boom. But he's also like, I need to take out 3% of his health. That's true. Would you let this go? Just drop Loot Hoarder armor up? I, the only other option is to pop uh, Dr. Boom and hope the Boom bots hit for... Yeah. Two boom bots hit for at least three damage on the. But you, no, Doomsayer. at least one damage, because then you inner rage the Doomsayer. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. I see. Okay, so he ends up just passing here. Or is he? He still has time. It's I, true that he could. That's actually really likely. You have a 50 f or a 75% chance that one of them hits the Doomsayer. That's true. You're anticipating your opponent to play Alex Straza next turn, because that's usually what happens. They set up Doomsayer for Alex Straza and then do some combos. But if it doesn't hit the Doomsayer, you just right. gave up like big threat. Yeah. You just gave up like all of your uh, damage. Second nice block, and then no Alex Straza, so I guess it's Archmage time. Archmage, Fireball, and Coin. Actually, you Coin and Fireball with the one that's four damage. Much better. All right, seven cards left in the mage's hand, or in the mage's deck. Eight cards left in Luffy's deck. They're going through their decks at he, even paces. He was at 60 health, so if he can do 60 damage, maybe. But now he's in a similar situation. It's like, well, I guess I got to hit this Antonidas and maybe try to kill it. What else is he supposed to do? I don't know. Okay, so if it... If he doesn't kill the Archmage Antonitis this turn, right? He takes five damage from swinging, uh, swinging into the Archmage Antonitis. Doctor Boom dies because he fireballs it. Doctor Boom dies because he fireballs it. He replaces that damage. He's got 22 damage in his hand right now. 27 from the Archmage Antonitis. He'd have to live for Alex Shazza does 13. 13. So 40. So but 40. He still needs to find a dude. He still has to find another way to do 15 damage. So either Archmage Antonitis would have to live for one more turn after that, or. No. Oh. Hey. Is he the chosen one? No. To face? Oh, oh. Right, it's nice dies. And I'm sure it's a lot less exciting. Yeah, I'm sure Corneko's expression is not what his ah, picture Ah, never lucky. Is. Uh. Okay, so I guess you fireball this uh, Doctor Boom then. Your last, absolute last hope is that Alex Straza gets repetitive damage mm -hmm. and just hits for like 24 plus the. Plus, you're probably going to have to heal yourself. 
realistically speaking. So I think you, uh, you just blizzard here, ping the face. On. Start chipping away. There's really no other reason to do anything else. Uh, I mean, there also is the... You have to factor in fatigue. If you get Alex Shraza down and your opponent starts taking fatigue damage and runs out of cards, there's a chance. Okay, so he ends up using Fireball instead, opting to keep the Blizzard in case he needs to stall. But the thing is, he's not going to win the Fatigue War, TJ. I've got bad news for Corneco. If Alex Straza lives and he can swing with it. That's he's only true. drawn one more card. It's true. He's, he's going to hit Fatigue one turn faster. So he's all in on the Alex Straza. All in on Alex Straza, effectively. That belongs in a museum. Uh, Luffy will feel like he never can play with his accolade anymore, so he's just going to play one thread at a time. Make sure he armors up every single turn. Mm -hmm. It's a smarter play. He can just pass. He's really calculating the odds. Oh, accolade is dangerous. So, I, oh man, if I'm more Neko, I ping that accolade in Blizzard in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Let my opponent draw cards. You're not trying to outcard your opponent at this point. You're both within fatigue range in the next couple turns. You both only have five cards left. How much do we have exactly? Well, it was on both sides? it was seven for Corneco two turns ago and eight for Luffy two turns ago. So I'm guessing it's five, five and six. And five? Oh yeah, five because he drew one more. Yeah. Right. You can make him go down to three cards here. One of these cards is Alex Strassen. These last five. What else is there? He's got one more Frost Bolt, Ice Lance. Use his flame strike because it's a little bit more mana cost. And... <laughs> Sludge Belcher number two. Fire War X. Can he pop the block? I mean, four Grim Patrons, one of which no, would be one five. Of them's an ice barrier, I think. Right, so he's got 17 health. No, he's got 17 damage. He can have four Grim Patrons, one of which has five damage, so that's nine plus five would be 14 plus firework is 17. You're right. Get a pop the block. Because he would Grim Patron, in a rage one Grim Patron to be at five health, he'd have a three three. Whirlwind, have four Grim Patrons, three of which have three damage, one of which has five damage. 14 plus the firework. 14 war plus fireworks is 17. Doesn't have enough mana to do that. He can't equip the fire war axe and do that. Oh yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. I was thinking into, or, the last game where he had all of his fireworks and ended up being one mana. Mm -hmm. What world, what kind of world would we live in if fireworks cost one mana? Oh, a world where Emperor Thorson came down this turn. <laughs> you might as well start going through the Ice Bear. You have to anyways, right? Yeah. Can't enter Otherwise, face. I mean, his fire war axes are 12 damage. I mean, Ice Lance is not that helpful here. Just Pyroblast. No, uh, well, I'd rather use Fireball and keep Fireblast for something else, or Pyroblast for something else. I wonder. Fireball. Uh, just ping the two, one, two. This has gotten down really slow, but now it's starting to get to the almost exciting part. So this is. This is it, right? This yeah, is, this is the 17 damage. Yeah. Warsong, Grim Patron, Inner Rage, and uh, Whirlwind. That pops it. He can't put him to one. It's, uh, but it's fine because he's got another Fiery War Axe. But then his opponent, if the opponent has Alex Straza and say he got Thorsund. I don't know. It's still, he still has a Warsong Commander, so... What's his last card? Grim Patron, right? Um, did he use both frothings already? I think so. So that's the second Grim Patron that's remaining. Unless it's like a spell, like I don't know if we've seen two whirlwinds yet. This game's gone on for a really long time. Yeah, it's starting to mesh with the last two games. Yeah, he's got to go. It's time to do it. No, he doesn't pop the ice block. Says, I'm just going to wait out the long, ga long game. It's more than likely that even if he just armors up from yeah. here on out, he's 
still going to have a good chance. I would love it if just like he said, screw Alex Draza, I have Nefarian in this deck. <laughs> Nefarian gets like... What? You couldn't even get any spells that would help you at all. From a uh, warrior? From a warrior? She uh, no, shield block. Oh. <laughs> For some reason, I thought it was going to hit the 1-1 one because -one, it's just the animation, but... Yeah, yeah. it's Grim Patron. Okay. Yeah, really smart to get that uh, pile bus out of the way. It's just going to be sitting there for a while. Well, he's in the same situation he is this turn than he was last turn. He could pop the block mm -hmm. if he wants. I think he's mousing over the armor up right now, actually. I saw the, the glow slightly increase in potency. I'm actually still really surprised he hasn't started swinging with the Fiery War Axes to get through the armor, which is necessary anyways. Alex Strauss is a really key card here. He Alex Strauss is the face! That's how confident he is. He's contemplating using Ice Lance so that he can stall and hopefully his opponent doesn't have a way to deal with it. And now, no more Ice Block Pop. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. I feel like Luffy might have lost his opportunity to win the game, but we're about to see if he can still do this, because the Whirlwind and the he Grim Patience <laughs> allow him to deal with the Alex Straza. <laughs> That's all he needs to do, really. Once Alex Straza's dead, how is he going to kill him? The Accolade of Pain <laughs> needs to live. Oh, yeah, do. that's true. Wait, <laughs> what's the remaining card from? Frostbolt. Oh, yeah, Frostbolt. So he doesn't have enough burn. This is what he was waiting for, actually, sitting on the, the Alex Straza removal. Yeah. Both players are just waiting for their opponents. Yeah. Crossbolt and Ice Lance, maybe? Ice Lance number two. Yeah. Why don't I just whip out Malagos out of nowhere? <laughs> he still wouldn't win. Well, if Malagos could swing, yeah. I think so. But, I mean, he's... Because uh, he, he's got to have a turn to develop, and then his block's going to get popped, and he would have the second one. Uh, maybe. I wonder if Luffy's just going to, like, never attack into the armor. Of Ice Barrier. Just wait for Fatigue? Yeah. Considering he could have popped the block last turn and still have exactly right. the same second yeah. Warsong and Grim Patron to deal with this. Okay. No Whirlwind. There's the Frostbolt. 35 damage. How many turns does his opponent need to take? Because he's got... <laughs> All right, whatever. Just go for it. Yeah. I was trying to do some math, but it's really hard to do it without being able to see it. 25 health. He's going to take a second fatigue damage. This is why not many people play Freeze Mage on ladder. Right. Two. <laughs> He's getting there. And if uh, Luffy just armors up. If he armors up and he just lets fatigue do his damage, that's four turns before he just guaranteed kills. Because for, you can't have the secret activate on your turn. So Ice Block will not pop. And that means in four turns. That's five turns from now. If he can survive five turns of fatigue damage, which is three plus four, that's seven, plus five, that's uh, 12, plus six is 18 damage. Yeah, he's fine. He's got Flame Strike. No, no, no. no. It, but the thing is, there's like as long as Luffy just armor up passes, there's no way for him to lose this game. Okay. As long as he just keeps armor up passing. He might, if he like decides to attack uh, spontaneously and just choose to... Yeah, this is also another reason why Frostbolt in the face was not a good idea, because he also just lost his ability to use uh, Ice Yeah, he wanted to protect the the his block or with the weapon. He just wanted to stop the weapon from attacking, I think. Irrelevant. You need that damage. Corneco has uh, definitely not been able to pressure, uh, or not be able to withstand the pressure enough. And Luffy ends up cornering Koroneko with uh, the Grim Patron. That was a pretty brutal game, man. Yeah. It, especially just the length of it alone yeah. is pretty devastating for Koroneko to try and scrape for an opportunity for him to find a way back in that game. Mm -hmm. It was pretty much all in on Alex Straza. Yeah. As soon as it was removed, all hope was just stripped away. I also um, was not really happy with how Corneco used some of his uh, his spells. He ended yeah. up sitting on Blizzard and Flame Strike for a long time. Yeah, and it's because he eventually he was using things like fireballs for removal on things when he really could have set up for like better Flame Strikes, better Blizzards, 
and then use that damage to potentially give him the opportunity. So, like, say that Ice Ants got damage in. That was four damage. Say he used his other Fireball that he used on Gromosh, when he could have set it up for uh, instead. That's another 10 damage. And then you invite him into the race where you're pinging him every turn, and he start taking a lot of fatigue damage because it's very clear that he's not activating your Ice Barrier. Yeah. Because the thing is, he had 18 damage that he would have taken by the time that he would have died. And he had 25 at that time, which means that if you shredded that remaining 8 health with a 10 damage burn, and you're paying him every turn over the course of three turns. He had 13 to 14 damage. He would have been gaining three or four life. He had the win there. But of course, that's 15 turns in advance. Like, if you can plan that far ahead <laughs> as your Kornaka, then you're like a Freeze Mage god. Yeah. But uh, because he's only thinking about the immediate, he ended up not doing it. Now, of course, we have the luxury as commentators to know that because we see both hands. And we also have hindsight. So we have two tools that are unfair. Yeah. OP. Commentators OP. But we are going to move into game number five here. Cornico still has to find one with this Freeze Mage. And this is the first time we're going to be seeing the Warlock from Luffy. Don't know if it's Zuya. Don't know if it's Handlock. We can make some guesses, but until we see that opening hand, we'll never know for sure. Two completely different matchups against Freeze Mage. Freeze Mage very strong against Zoo. Uh, but Handlock does have a lot of tools to be able to take down a Freeze Mage. With cards like anti Killbot. Lotheb to buy some turns, ruin power turns for Freeze Mage. Even cards just like putting out a lot of pressure earlier. Like if they can get a couple Mount Giants, Twilight Drakes, and then use Owls to protect them from Doomsayers. Things like that make it uh can make it pretty tough for Freeze Mages to pull ahead. And it is gonna be handlock. Alright, so you were saying that you felt like Luffy was more of a, a, a zoo player, but he ends up whipping out the handlock. And the handlock is much better suited to fight against the freeze mage than zoo, in my opinion. Lothep, a very important keep. Big game hunter, just kind of sits there until Alex Straza comes out. If he has to, he might even drop it early. All right, so keys for this matchup are to put lots of pressure out earlier if you're the handlock. Try and draw into those big threats. I mean, it's pretty standard for most matchups as Handlock. Drawing into those Mountain Giants, drawing into those Twilight Drakes. And then protecting them from Doomsayer. Yeah. Owl's a good card. Owl's good for the Science and the Doomsayer. Ancient Watcher, because you're going to be tapping anyways, and then on turn four, you don't really have anything else to do. Mm hmm. You can keep the coins, so that way you can coin Thor soon. Would you consider... No, it's not. That's kind of ridiculous. Are you going to say like, Owl the Ancient Watcher? Um, no, I was talking. I was thinking like a few turns ahead of like, would you play Lothep to set up the Thor soon? But I think Lothep's just like, that's a waste of it. Yeah. You can use it to protect the board. Or it, even to just um, buy one more turn. Later on. <laughs> I feel like the pressure done through the Owl and Beak Owl on the Ancient Watcher is minimal because he, you, he's just going to use Fireball. And you're going to be tapping anyways. Yeah. This, oh, yeah. Well, he's going to go for it. It's it's sort of forcing inefficient plays. I mean, if you're having to Fireball this, then you're not really developing anything or drawing cards. Yeah. Now he doesn't have a way to deal with it, so he's going to be taking six damage the falling turn as well. I would have considered even using Ice Lance there. You're losing a lot of health. I like, might even I load up right now. You load up, you guarantee, almost guarantee at least nine damage next turn. Yeah. I agree. Job's done. That's a pretty big deal. This is a lot of pressure being put out really early on by Luffy. Not something you usually see handlock players do. This sort of is reminiscent. Yeah, I um, I'm not sure. This is actually so much damage. Let the pain speak to me. He's hitting the owl because he needs to stop taking damage. Defender is pretty strong. Just more damage onto the board. <laughs> you can put him at sub ten health. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Hmm. He's this is like more aggression than you would even deal with from like a zoo warlock. 
Sludge Belch is on curve. Defender of Argus is just more power immediately, so you can do um, 11 damage instead of 9. Well, Doomseer comes out next turn. It's not going to have any way to deal with it, but some of this damage has already been done. It's going to be hard to, to find a way to play defensively for the rest of the game around yourself having only like 10 health. Frost Nova Doomsayer almost is a necessity. Yeah, he can't get away with Thorson here. He, he needs the secrets. Um, I mean, he can Frost Nova and ping his uh, Frost Nova Loot Hoarder and then Doomsayer the next turn. So turn. what is, do you just need Siphon Soul or Silence of some kind? I mean, I think uh, Luffy's put enough pressure where you can just tap. Kind of like let things go. Yeah. And the one two still survives, so that's another target on the board. Hmm. He's got dark bomb as well. A little bit of extra burn. Yeah. No, it's really useful to have damage from the hand. If you ever get down to one, then you just need to ice like pop the ice block. Yeah. Emperor Thor's hand is actually really strong. Just because he's going to be able to do multiple things in the next coming turns. Oh, that's turns. crazy. He needs to be able to stop incoming damage at the same time trying to draw into like secrets like ice barrier ice block in the next couple turns because he's taken so much damage this far that he doesn't have the luxury of being able to make like uh, full draw turns like a lot of times early on in free in freeze mage you you have turns where the only thing you do is draw and you just it just allows you to draw into more options quicker but now it's his play sort of has to split in between drawing and making sure that he deals with the pressure from the board because he's taken so much damage already Uh, he can deal with this Thorson. He choose to play Sylvanas I instead. Wonder. I guess so that way he can maybe steal it, but he can also attack into Thorson, Hellfire, and Mortal Coil. It's just that his follow-up play after that is not that great, and he doesn't want to put himself within potential killing range. Yeah. In fact, if um, if he used Hellfire and tabs, he also might be within killing range if his opponent drew Fireball. Two Emperor Thorson turns. That's really scary. But he's also very close to being able to kill his opponent. Hey. Sylvanas is really hard to deal with right now because you can't like remove the board because yeah. then you're giving up your Emperor Thorsan. You don't have to though. You can you can make a play like Sylvanas is sometimes a liability to play mm -hmm. against Freeze Mage just because you can Doomsayer and then Fireball it to remove, but there's nothing really to remove here. So playing it on a board like this is actually probably the strongest way you can play it against Freeze Mage. How much damage super annoying. Uh, is this? If he has Thanos, he's got 14. Two Ice Lances and a Frost Bolt. Yeah. So I'd actually consider using Frost Nova here, right? And setting up Mad Scientist. All right, so he wants to use this uh, to set up so he yeah. can stay. It's only one target as well. Kind of feels weird to use it on one target. Ice Lance is burned, mm -hmm. though. Yeah, it's burned, but he gets to put out minions, which is the equivalent of burn. Mm -hmm. An owl means he dies. Well, he's one damage off lethal. Or is it, am I missing something? Does he have lethal? No. Can't. He wouldn't even have enough mana, even if you could mortal coil the face. You can hellfire and dark bomb your Sylvanas steel Thorson. Steal a one health Thorson. Meanwhile, your opponent draws two cards, gets a secret up. Yeah. Hellfire Mortal Coil is also appropriate if you mm -hmm. just want to, you know, keep things alive. Yeah. So finally, the secret has been drawn. We'll see Sun what it Fury is. Sunfury Protector is meh. Does he want to tap into anything? He's been trying to avoid tapping at all costs here, apparently. Shields up. He doesn't really have a, a need to. Yeah, he's trying to get as much board presence so he can potentially pop the block. All right, it is ice block. All right, so if I'm Corneco, no worries. Just go ahead, flame strike, play a uh, mad scientist, or even the arcane intellect. Yeah. Everything is fine. You're at seven health. What is he gonna do? <laughs> oh, he's, he might rag. If he rags, if you're afraid of rag, you can play mad scientist. 
You can play Mad Scientist regardless. How is he gonna? He needs a. Uh... Just, there's, there's. I, I'm actually kind of perplexed that he's not flame striking mm -hmm. here. I think he's trying to see if he can calculate Archmage Antonidas damage. Perhaps? Yeah, I was thinking maybe Archmage Antonidas, and no, he can't do that. Uh, Archmage it's too Antonidas risky. Frost Nova, and then that's really risky. You're putting your opponent on not having anything to be able right. to kill off their own Sylvanas. Because yeah. if, if you, if they steal your Archmage Antonidas, that's pretty much game mm -hmm. over. Okay, so he uses his Frost Bolt here and ends up trying to use his Antonitis so he can accumulate another Fireball. I gotta admit, TJ, I'm, I'm really baffled by some of these plays. Yeah. I, these are some of the plays that I'm least expecting here because he's giving up Burn, which is what he uses to get past Handlock, to acquire more Burn, which is more expensive, when he has Thanos in hand. The, the, the big question mark is because Thanos... With Frostbolt, Ice Lances, and a Fireball, is 21 damage. And you got you got th four out of those five cards reduced. So if you picked up any Fireball, you could have been able to squeeze up to 27 damage. He seems very hesitant to use the Flame Strikes in both games now. He's held on to those. In the last game, you mentioned he had Blizzard and Flame Strike in his and hand at the end of the game. Using them. I wonder if he's mentally blocking out Flame Strike, but it's definitely something that I, I think if Corneco had to reevaluate and he ends up not using this Flame Strike, uh, it ends up being a thing like, well, what are you saving it for? Mm -hmm. Giants are so not going to be affected by Flame Strike. You can't Flame Strike twice in a turn. Now, interestingly enough, despite all this, there's no way to actually deal with the Antonitis. How much damage can that is that next turn? Uh, let's see, twenty-one. Is that? He has to kill the mad scientist. Yeah. yeah, mad scientist. Just in order to prevent lethal. Wait, oh, what? What? Oh man, he, he didn't play he wasn't mad expecting scientist. the Thanos. Oh yeah, yeah, Thanos. Thanos. Yeah, that's what I meant. Well, that ends the game. Wow. The series and Luffy is out. And, and a, a couple of steps on both ends where it just ends up being the thing that cost them. You know, using that silence really early yeah. on the Ancient Watch to pressure. Cool idea, but Handlock's not known to be a class that that can do that. No. Um, there was a turn where he was one damage off lethal, but right. Uh, he didn't have that silence to protect anything on his board. Sure. And uh, there's just a lot of versatile uses of it. And in the same time, he ends up using things like his Sun Fury Protector or, like, to try and, and get that board. Because he committed to that line of play where he just pressures opponents out of the game. But because of that, he dropped things like Sun Fury Protector. And you know, yeah. as a result, Archmage Engine 9 has hit the face that turn. Mm -hmm. These type of things, the, the decisions end up compounding each other. Uh, not the cleanest series played on both ends. It was actually very scrappy and you know a little bit dirty on both ends. But... In the end, uh, Corneco advances to the round of four, and that is our second series of the day. Quite the contrast from the first one. That was a slugfest. Yeah, that really was. And to be honest, it, it looked like Corneco was sort of on the back foot there. Yeah. And decisions he was making were a little bit bizarre, but he ends up pulling it out. Uh, I made a mistake earlier saying that the winner of this match plays uh, Luigi, Luigi's, uh, but since we had that buy earlier, Luigi's will face Roger oh, okay. later on, and uh, Corneco will actually face the winner of the next match, which is going to be the Season 1 Legendary Series Land Finals winner, Silent Storm, trying to make a return, uh, sure. taking on Domdis, who's a little bit of an unknown player. Yeah, uh, Domdis is, I think, going to have a, a lot in his hands, but uh, more importantly, I think Silent Storm has a really cool lineup. I can't wait to talk about that as well. Um, you know, and Of course, we'll see Corneco back. I think he's going to have to go back and uh, really evaluate because uh, he can't win today playing like that continually. Yeah. There's just too many things that ended up potentially backfiring, which somehow worked out. But there's a lot of scenarios where he could have won the series 3-1 or maybe you know 3-0. It depends on how things go. Uh, and that, that's definitely not the way he wants to play going this point forward. Yeah, well, he's got two more matches to win if he wants to yep. qualify for that land. But next matchup is going to be Silent Storm versus Domdis, and that's going to take place right after this break.